Hello, and welcome to the Humumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown. The podcast where we watch 31 horror movies throughout the hallowed month of October. Ranging from the critically acclaimed to film school projects gone gruesomely awry. And we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hummel. And I'm your host, Sully Hummel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously while we take these movies seriously. We may have experienced a first for me. Uh Uh-oh. With this movie. That's what I want to start with because I can't start with the word today. (laughs) Don't tell them that. I'm just going to say, like, this this may be a first, and not necessarily in a good way. What is it a first of? We'll get there. We'll get there. Oh. I'm talking about the movie Splice from 2009, which is a sci-fi genetic horror kind of a thing, right? We have yes. our two scientists who are doing genetic experimentation, and they create this new life. I'm just looking at my notes and realizing I could name about 10 firsts to give you for this movie. Interesting. I look forward to hearing about some of them. Okay. Our intrepid scientists have discovered how to splice genes together to create new things. Pretty much at random. The experiment they share with people is like two slug things that they created. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, little slug monsters. And unfortunately, their company is not as impressed with these slug things as they should be. That is stage one of my concerns about this movie. They created a new form of life that has never existed before. And their new director is just like, eh. But how do we make money with it? I don't know. Show people you made a new form of life. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Bring back the circus. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that is the greatest breakthrough in the history of mankind. And they're like, but come on. What we really want is the protein it creates. Right. We have to weaponize and monetize this. So there's that. And of course, then their funding is cut and their program is shut down, as happens to all movie scientists. Yeah. And they're not prepared to let this go. No, it's fun. They, they have a lengthy montage of sciencey things. Yeah, they scienced it up with music. They did. One thing that amused me about that montage is that they were getting progressively more tired, which I understand as a thing where if this had gone on over time, but also the time was very unclear. So yeah. I couldn't tell if this was unreasonable and unbelievable because they had weeks within which to do this last minute stuff yeah. or if it was unreasonable and unbelievable because they created <laughs> an entirely new 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 life form another one in like one evening yeah which I of mean, those do you think was actually happening i got the impression it was like one evening but yeah <laughs> that happened i mean if for no other reason alone then a, a bunch of the things that they were doing definitely took time like they were yeah. you know cook these gene soups you know like that yeah. takes time processing all kinds of science stuff yeah it was a very unbelievable montage mm-hmm. but by the end of it they have created a new thing and then that new thing grows really fast suddenly is ready to it's like its mechanical womb is ready to go and they have What was sort of a fancier slug to begin with. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Which then evolved into a raw chicken. Yeah. And then evolved into a toddler. Then evolved into a really hot girl. (laughs) Well. For a significant portion. Like, for most of the movie. Yeah. She was in hot girl phase. (laughs) And then hot girl evolved into gargoyle dragon. Yeah. You're not going to call it hot dude? No, but, like, twink isn't my thing. (laughs) I mean, I'm sure some people might think that, but that was a really, like, scrawny... Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. So you're referring to, at the end of the movie, their female monster 
change genders. Yes. And I thought it was interesting that in the process, it face shape changed to be more masculine. Like, it was a man. And it was like... Um, because huh. they had to get a new actor inside <laughs> the monster suit because now the monster was a boy and they couldn't have a girl playing a boy. Yeah. That was just like a transphobia moment was like, oh, they're saying the worst thing that could possibly happen is that this scary monster changes to another gender. Like, that's the worst. Yeah. Uh, do you think that transphobia in there was, like, intentional or was it just... Did did know. it happen because they were thinking about, like, oh, we put all these different genes in here and, you know, they used whatever genes from whatever reptile, amphibian, oh, yeah. fish, to be a frog whatever, or something. that does that in real life. And so they just were like, sometimes things do that, and this is one of those things now. And they just didn't think about how it reads. I mean, it was from uh, 2009. Yeah. I don't know, because, I mean, I feel like almost instead of transphobia, it was... It took me a minute to Google this, but androphobia. Because... It wasn't that they were changing genders, which the slugs also ended up doing. Well, mm -hmm. one of the slugs. And of course, once that happened, they violently murdered That's each other. That's the thing. Once that happened, the slugs violently murdered each other. Once their main monster switched, it violently murdered everybody. The premise wasn't so much that turning into the other gender is bad. It's that men are bad. They will kill anything. Well, I'm going to say that the monster becoming male and being a bad thing was not the only evidence that men are bad in this movie. It really wasn't. But here's the thing. Towards the end of the movie, I'm like, this is like a contest on who can be the worst. <laughs> really, like, they, the two it's of not them were just really men. trying hard. It's true. At that point, I think probably around the same point that you were making that note, <laughs> I was thinking it's like somebody sat down and made a list of all the things that are socially unacceptable, culturally unacceptable, yeah. <laughs> like all the taboos we could think of. And then was like, what if we made a movie and included all? All of this. <laughs> yeah. I have a list. Okay. Problematic gender norms, problematic culture norms, infantilizing of women, mm. pedophilia, incest, or something akin to incest, you know, like the Woody Allen style <laughs> incest. Yes. <laughs> emotional abuse and neglect, physical abuse, otherism, bestiality, adultery, rape. Was there anything I forgot? I'm sure there had to be, but... Ugh. I mean, straight up unethical science, obviously. Potential transphobia. Potential transphobia. I'm going to say because it was from 2009, like, not that transphobia didn't exist in 2009. <laughs> that, that's the problem. It did. <laughs> I, I just think it wasn't necessarily an overt thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to read into it because it's... It's problematic. I don't think it was as problematic at that point. Oh, uh, animal cruelty. Oh, yeah. There were so many ways that these two scientists were the worst human beings. The worst. I guess they were made for each other because they were a couple. Ugh. They were not a good couple. No. Oh, also toxic masculinity. Oh, yeah. Trauma cycles because she had an abusive mother and clearly grew up to be an abusive mother. Yep. She sure did. And there was this, like, sense of inevitability about all of it, which is what I have a problem with. I don't have yeah. a problem with addressing social taboos in movies. But the way the movie presented all of these things were like, this is the only way it could have gone. Yeah. What are you going to do? If you're going to make a new life form and it's going to have breasts, <laughs> you're going to have to have sex with it. What else can you do? Eh. It was one of those perfect examples of, you know, they, they often talk about how men should be the ones who are most upset by toxic masculinity because it presents this idea that men are no better than this. Like, mm -hmm. they're no better than the people who go out and kill other people and, you know, solve their problems with violence and rape and murder and blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah, all of these horrible absolutely. things. This movie 
definitely was an example of that because it it really it was just like well this is this is how men are yeah and, and they're not that's what the <laughs> the monster transformations always did so yeah they were just like that for sure but also just yeah. this male scientist Clive at no point I mean he got in trouble because his girlfriend the scientist caught him but also I sort of got the sense that she was more angry that he was cheating on her <laughs> than that he was having sex with something that they controlled to the point of her not having any ability to provide consent. Yeah, everything about that scenario was bad. Just everything. And then we flip it around and the monster becomes the male. And then there's an entirely gratuitous and unnecessary rape scene in the other direction. Yeah. So... Everybody gets to have sex with the alien, whether they want to or not. Exactly. Ugh. Okay, so that sort of brings me to the first that I am experiencing, right? Okay, <laughs> I feel like we've named several, but yeah, what's this one? I mean, yes, it was just an avalanche <laughs> of terrible things. But here's the thing, I don't know that I've ever been as angry with a movie that was this well made. Yeah. I feel like this was a well-made movie. This movie had a budget. It was well-acted. It had all the things. Mm -hmm. So what about Revenge? Was Revenge well-made? I don't remember it as that. Yeah, it was really highly polished, I would say. Uh, Not well-written. Okay, maybe that's part of it. Because I'm realizing you're right. That movie had pretty good pr- production values, but the writing was so bad. Oh, yeah. But that one maybe was a, like, translation language issue that they were writing, if they were Belgian and they were writing an English movie, like, maybe there was some issue I don't, there. No, because they didn't understand the laws of physics. That movie was a disaster. <laughs> okay, so see, we're right back to where I started then, that there were maybe some good things. This one... I don't have complaints about any of the rest of it. I do. (laughs) It's the same thing. This is a perfect twin to Revenge. I'm glad we started talking about that because everything that happened in this movie is not what would happen in real life. Like this whole, the the overnight genetics that they did. Well, yeah. And everything about the science was insane. And then everything about business was insane. And it was like, none of this is how it works. They're like, oh, we'll keep her in the barn. Don't put her in the house because all the people who come visit this abandoned farmhouse are going (laughs) to see her there. Which then doesn't make any sense because if it's an abandoned farmhouse, they're more likely to be concerned if there's only lights on in the barn (laughs) than if it looks like someone moved into the house. Everything just... Everything was insane. Also, I had thoughts because it got progressively colder and it was like winter and snowy out. And I was like, this creature you created has very thin skin and she's Mm -hmm. an amphibious creature. Like, they don't do well in the cold. Yeah. Uh, They they had like a space heater we saw at one point, but all the walls of this barn had like inch wide gaps running all through them. Yeah, it was not well insulated. So, yeah, okay... I don't know then. I don't know. It just felt like such a good movie, except that all of these things were a part of it. And I, I, it was, there was cognitive dissonance in my brain while I was watching this movie. Yeah. Early on in this movie, I was like, oh, this is, you know, this is pretty good what they're doing, even though none of the science makes any sense. But as it went on, I was just like, what, what, (laughs) why are we doing this? Just over and over One of the interesting things towards the beginning was that, you know, traditionally, there's the evil corporation who wants to do something terrible, and the heroic scientists working there who are like, I won't do it, and whatnot. And this was the polar opposite. The suits were the ones who were right. They're like, no. They were the good guys. Don't make any monsters. Let's just stop (laughs) doing that. Even... Like, in any other movie, they would have realized they were making monsters and then tried to monetize the monsters or weaponize the monsters. And in this case, they were like, oh, you can't do that. We (laughs) Just stop. Stop. And then the heroic scientists, our our stars, were like, no, no, we're going to secretly make a monster and we're the good guys. Uh, There were so many lines where 
the words coming out of the scientist's mouth, I was just like, OMG, <laughs> like you are committing war crimes right now. Yeah, they were. Like these are straight up like Nazi scientists. At one point after the thing that they eventually called Dren, when Dren had been hatched, born, what have you, <laughs> like that first night they left Dren in the lab and they weren't went to bed and and Clive like can't fall asleep because he's so concerned what if it's suffering because they thought I mean it was like slug shaped like they thought yeah. it was some kind of malformed nothing right yeah. he's like what if it's feeling pain what if it's suffering basically he was going to go put it out of its misery and Elsa's response was but think of all the things we can learn from it and I'm like yeah. what now yeah I, there was a lot of that where they they would flip flop between loving parents of this creature who are terrible terrible parents to I'm a robot scientist I'm not gonna have any connection to it and I mean part of that was definitely in the story where she flipped on a dime because she was mad but it was weird <laughs> it was it was very I mean I think I like that part of the story I think that made it interesting is that they were like struggling between these mm -hmm. two things yeah that's a reasonable challenge and it did put me in an awkward position because there were many times when they were parenting her and i was like you guys are scientists like why are you <laughs> behaving this way so basically i was advocating for put her back in the cage yeah but then we got to the point where she had been like like we could see we knew that she was a living thinking breathing feeling creature and then every time they would try to be sciencey i'm like absolutely not this is a living thing you cannot yeah. just be conducting experiments on it i was in a very uncomfortable place i mean place. every part of it was very illegal which may have been the whole point of the movie to put you in that uncomfortable place yeah is it certainly did that well i wasn't comfortable with anything they did either way <laughs> nope nope uh, you know speaking of science that made me uncomfortable early in the movie when they were trying to get dren out of the artificial womb clive cuts it open with a scalpel goo gets all over the knife <laughs> yeah. and he puts it in his mouth well, to grab something hand. he needed his hand free the gooey scalpel <laughs> in his mouth yeah Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that's um, one of their protocols. There was the time where Elsa, they still don't know what this creature is like. And no. Elsa like takes her face mask off and removes a glove in order yeah. to touch it. Yeah, because she was making friends. Yeah, the scientific method was nowhere to be found no. with these no. scientists. They did flip-flop in this way where like it would totally alternate of... Which one of them was treating it like a baby and which one was treating it like a, well, either a science experiment or a monster that had to be killed, depending on the situation. Like, like they would shift back and forth between the two of them. It was weird. It, it definitely messed with my allegiances. Like, mm -hmm. towards the beginning, Clive is trying to kill it. He's like, yeah, just, just murder this thing and be done. Well, Elsa's like... Oh, little friend, raw chicken, come pet me. And then later, it's exactly the opposite, where he's like, I'm going to dance with you and have sex with you, monster. And she was like, now it's time to strap you to a table and cut your tail off. So weird. Yeah. Now, if we want to give them the benefit of the doubt, there are ways that I could say, like, there's a lot of metaphor and analogy in this movie maybe is what? what i'm and and that is one of those situations because in all of that that is very representative of an abusive parent child relationship that uh, yeah, the that whole complete movie was. unpredictability around which parent do you have coming mm, into the room uh -huh. at any given moment and are you going to be met with love or you know strict rules or you know what's happening so that, that may have been metaphor, right? Yeah, it felt like, you know, there was a clear thing early on where Clive wanted to have a baby and Elsa did not in their real life, real mm -hmm. baby. So that was a conflict. And then we jump into them raising this monster baby. Mm -hmm. And you could clearly see this was a metaphor of raising a child. Mm -hmm. I mean, not so much a metaphor because they kind of were just doing that, but sort of a metaphor and 
They were so bad at it. <laughs> well, it went straight into That's why I wrote down toxic culture no- norms and gender norms. Because they went straight into the dad can't be bothered, doesn't want to touch mm-hmm. the baby, blah, 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 blah. And the mom immediately is all nurturing and everything. Yeah. This woman didn't want to have children. I know. She I had, thought that was so weird. They were it, in the wrong roles. Right. And and it was purely a gender-based thing. Like, if they had gone by their personalities, <laughs> they would have been the opposites. Yeah. Which would have maybe made this more interesting. So they jumped straight into that. Yeah. And then they just were terrible. Like, she definitely reenacted you know, this toxic cycle that had been developed with her own mother, which is understandable, but again, not as inevitable as the yeah. movie makes it seem. Well, and it, it wasn't necessary. Like, her whole story of having been clearly very abused, mm-hmm. like, they saw the cell she grew up in, mm-hmm. and that being a part of this movie, I mean, it adds another layer, but why do we have that layer? There's so much to work with on the whole raising a monster thing that that just makes it more complicated and uglier i mean it does make it uglier i kind of think it makes it more interesting to me and actually as you're pointing out that her bedroom like they made a point of seeing her bedroom and he was like i thought you said she left it exactly the way it was and she's like she did when you contrast that like what her bedroom looked like with what they did to the barn. I mean, yes, they kept her in the barn. And yes, she was trapped there. But I think from Elsa's point of view, she gave her sofas and beds and Mm -hmm. decorations and lights and made it homey (laughs) so that it was okay. Like she was better than her mom. And when you, you know, as the viewer, you're looking and you're like, okay, but you still have this thing in a cage. It's just a bigger barn shaped cage with comfy pillows so i mean i think that adds kind of a layer of interest for me yeah but it just i think the problem i see is clive and elsa are the protagonists of this movie there's no one else to root for and Mm -hmm. they are monsters yes like i don't know what to do with this movie because i don't care about anybody i want them all to die yeah except the monster should have just let it I be. I mean, there were several times where they could have just let the monster be and the monster would have been fine, but instead they turned the monster into a monster. Yeah. Which, again, I think that was intentional. It's a I think that was, you movie. know, it was a thing. There were a couple other metaphor, analogy kind of things that I noticed. One was paralleling, like, white supremacy and racism in that whenever these two wanted something from the monster, from... Mm. Dren, they treated Dren like a person. Yeah. And whenever they didn't like something or or Dren was inconveniencing them in some way, then they treated Dren like a creature. Yeah, they that, definitely would flip. And and so there was like this this idea that they considered themselves to be superior to her, but then also felt good about themselves because mm-hmm. sometimes they were nice to her anyway. Yeah, I can totally which is see really that. Really gross. Yeah. Super gross. Like, you know, it should be okay that she lives in a barn. She's just an animal. Yeah. And it's okay that I treat her like an animal because I gave her pillows. Also, like, she's my daughter. Be nice to her. Right? Yeah. Ugh. Okay, so there was that. And then I think the other thing that I was thinking of was less um, metaphor and more just the realization for myself that when you anthropomorphize an animal, you are just not listening to it. Like, that's it. You know, we we have this kind of romantic idea about when you have pets or you, you know, come across an animal and you, you you know, oh, but I love it. It's my baby. And I give it a bath and I do this and I do that. I would never... And it's like, okay, fine, but you're treating that animal in a way that is not necessarily the right way to treat an animal Mm -hmm. because you are pretending it's not an animal. And I don't know that that Dren could be classified as animal because there was definitely human DNA in her, but she was other enough. I mean, she could breathe underwater, (laughs) (laughs) which we found out when Clive tried to kill her. Yep, that is something I was going to bring up. So it feels wrong to say Dren is an animal, but also the anthropomorphizing that they were doing was problematic. All it did was mean that they weren't meeting her where she needed to be met. Oh, that reminds me of the other metaphor. Super, super ableist. 
Yeah. So she couldn't vocalize. I don't, she, she never made words. But like halfway through the movie, she's using Scrabble tiles to write words like tedious. Mm -hmm. So she has a vocabulary of like a 12th grader. And even after they knew that, did they get her like a typewriter? Yeah. Did they get her a computer? A did crayon? they give her a piece of paper? <laughs> no. At no point did they give her any way to express herself. They were just like, oh, she's so smart. <laughs> and then continued treating her like we treat dolphins and parrots, yeah. right? It made me feel a lot of really uncomfortable, bad feelings about how we treat dolphins and parrots. <laughs> yeah. And how much smarter than a human being should is she that in a few weeks she understood enough to use the word tedious and mean it correctly. Right. <laughs> like Right. Just picking that up from hearing people talk. Yeah. I mean at that point it may have been more like months, but still because it was like getting close to winter at that point. Yeah. But still, right, like, she's less than a year old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it just, it, it really, it made me think about that and how, you know, I I often see on Twitter deaf people talking about how frustrating it is that people just try to get them to read lips. And they're like, uh -huh. just give me a pen and a piece of paper and I can express myself and you can express yourself and we can communicate in a way that doesn't involve me having to guess what you're saying. Yeah. It was a very, like, revealing kind of a moment for me. Ratings. I honestly don't know how to rate this movie. I feel ya. Like, I'm legitimately, I don't know what to do. Because several times this month, I have given movies that were not even as horrible as this in terms of what they were presenting. <laughs> zeros yeah like i have flat out refused to give them any points at all for reasons that exist in this movie but a zero doesn't feel right for this movie no it doesn't feel like it's i don't know it doesn't feel like it's glorifying that only it kind of is because these are the heroes i don't know i mean okay these are the main characters. I don't yeah, know that right. we could call them heroes. I don't know that there are heroes in this movie, except for perhaps the uh, Stargate Atlantis guy. <laughs> yeah. Who was the suit who was driving them to do their evil project. Right. Who really just wanted to manage an ethical program. So I don't think I have a problem with that. It doesn't bother me as much to have bad guys as main characters. I guess... The issue is, and I've convinced myself even more of it as I've talked about like the metaphors and things, mm -hmm. the issue for me is that I can't tell how much of these things were put in intentionally to say, look how bad these things are. Right. And how many of those things were put in accidentally because they were just writing the story and they actually thought, well, this is what would happen. Yeah. It, it, that's what I mean about that. It, mm -hmm. A movie about a bad guy is fine. The Stylist was a movie about a bad guy. We followed a murderer doing her murdering. Whereas this one feels like these are our heroes. You know, I mean, hero is definitely the wrong word, but these are regular folks doing regular things. And yet they were terrible. And I don't think the movie knew they were terrible. It definitely knew, like... She was doing her cycle of abuse and mm -hmm. being like her mother. So, mm -hmm. like, that was bad. But it, we should feel bad because she's such a good person and this is bad. Yeah. And, like, no, she's not. <laughs> well, yeah. And the the things that I keep going back to that I'm like, you know, I want I want to say that this movie is trying to teach something good. But then I do not think that it was addressed properly that Clive decided to have sex with A, his science experiment, and B, this being that he has been raising as yes, a child. his adopted daughter. Like, this less than a year old science <laughs> experiment who he has been raising as, a, as his adopted daughter. Like, yep. there are so many pieces there. And I don't think any of those pieces were properly addressed, which gives me reason for concern. And then, once... Dren morphs into the uh, gargoyle dragon 
male at the end, that rape scene was completely unnecessary, as far as I can tell. I mean, like, they connected it to the ending, but yeah. I mean... They didn't have to have that ending. <laughs> they did not have to have that ending. And that wasn't enough to make it necessary for the story. Like, there are... Even if they had actually gone into the idea that this this creature that they created has a complex life cycle, like a monarch butterfly, where the life cycle goes over several years, mm -hmm. and it, like is a butterfly and it pupates and it does this and it that and it travels and it's like not even several years several generations yeah had they said this is what this you know have they somehow in, built that into the story that this creature has to be inseminated while it is female and then inseminate something oh. else while it is male in order for wow. it to be like that's part of its procreation cycle maybe it would have been it wouldn't a part make of the, the story, things that happened good. But no, that's the thing. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't make it okay. And uh, okay. I mean, it's a horror movie. They were going to horrify you. I mean, maybe they were really clever and about that. And they like, there's more than one way to horrify people. Let's see what we can do with a little pedophilia mixed in with incest and bestiality. <sighs> I mean, that goes back to my idea of somebody sat down and made a list of all the taboos and was yeah. like, all right, we're going to scare the pants off of some people. And that's that's why this movie gets so weird is that it doesn't feel like that. It's not mm -hmm. a crazy off the rails cannibal Holocaust movie. It's like a little sci-fi real world movie. Like, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's part of the art of it is it was you know, they presented it in this way so that you had to notice that these things were happening. You had yeah. to realize, like, that that it was sort of that subtle discomfort. Not that it was that subtle, no. but, like, a much different kind of discomfort than teenagers are being eviscerated in front of me. Yeah. I don't know. All right. So, I guess I have to put a number to this. I am going to give Splice three and a half janky barbie dolls out of five that is so many more than i expected i know i almost gave it a four wow. because like you said it's a horror movie it horrified me yeah and it has also given me a lot to talk about yeah i mean maybe it's appropriate that our main characters are horrible I just, when I think about saying I give this movie a four, it makes my stomach hurt and it makes my <laughs> mouth taste bad. So I can't do it. I'm going to give it a three and a half. I feel like people going into this movie prepared for it and then having discussions about the multitude of horrible things that happen would be a good thing. Like, I would recommend that. My concern is that people won't be prepared going in and then they won't have the conversations after, and then nothing good comes of the horror of this movie. Well, yeah, so. I think most people going in are going to be like, oh, this is one of those sci-fi flicks where the, you know, they make a monster and it kills them all. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. that's not know. what you're going to get. So, anyway, I'm giving it three and a half. What are you going to give it? I am disappointed that you didn't rate it in Splash Zones, <gasps> but nonetheless, oh, yeah. I'm going to give this movie... Two and a half janky Barbie dolls out of five. That's fair. Yeah, I just don't know, man. I, I, I feel like I don't know what that was either, whether that's it. I definitely don't recommend it. It's not worth it. See, that's where I'm not sure. I'm Ooh. not sure that I don't recommend it. There are some really interesting conversations to be had from this movie. I think so, yeah. And that's one of the reasons I recommend movies. And uh, I don't know. Certain people should watch this movie with certain other people and have those conversations. Yeah. People who aren't prepared to have those conversations should stay far, far away from this movie because they might pick up the wrong messages from it. It's so weird to me how they were presented as like regular okay folks. And then halfway through the movie, I'm like, this is like a contest as who can be the worst human being possible. Yeah. And it, I feel like it could have been the movie could have been made differently to where they seemed like terrible people. But, I mean, maybe that's, you know, that's know. too obvious. It's the art. It's yeah, the art. I'm no artist. Okay. 
Evil Twins. So let's set Splice aside. We will try. And move on to Spliced. Yeah, let's put Splice in the past. The Wisher, which is a totally different meaning of the word Splice. It sure is. We're now talking about movie making, and we're back to the world of murdering teenagers. Yeah, very much standardly back to that world where this feels like Freddy Krueger. Yes. They, they were trying to make Freddy Krueger and they yeah, they didn't do it. No, they did not. I'm glad to hear you say that because I was worried that maybe my dislike of this movie was just me and just... Oh, this was a dumb movie. That, it, that I just was not being patient enough with it. But yeah, I thought it was dumb as well. Just a super quick rundown. It is a story about the girl who likes scary movies. She goes to see one about The Wisher who grants wishes, but, you know, makes them evil. Like, every, just people don't make wishes because they're always going to be turned around on right. you. Right. There's no such thing as a free wish, yeah. folks. So after she sees this movie, suddenly, every time she wishes, something terrible happens that is what she wished for, but in a terrible way. And there's a Freddy Krueger guy with glass fingers. Yeah. So that's the movie. So is there anything from this movie that really particularly stands out to you as needing to be discussed? No, I think I think that's what there is to be said, is that it is a just a low-rent, badly done Freddy Krueger movie. I think they sort of had an interesting idea where the Wisher could be a real monster, or it could just be somebody pretending to be the Wisher, somebody who's seen the movie. And so that's sort of like an interesting mystery, except I don't feel like it's handled well, of course. Right. I have to give spliced or the wisher two wood nymphs out of five it's Mm -hmm. just kind of low budget kind of low quality all around Mm -hmm. it's not terrible terrible like it just wasn't really that interesting in any way so two out of five yeah i would put it more terrible than you and give it 1.5 wood nymphs out of five okay anything in particular that that brings it down to that point or it's just how you're Just feeling. the terribleness. All right. Not so terrible that it's a one, but not worth watching in any way. Our scores are kind of all over the place today. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is coming tomorrow? Ooh. Sadly, tomorrow was going to be the amazing pairing that I felt really good about. I was <laughs> yeah. so proud of. Who Can Kill a Child from 1976 paired with... Where are the children from 1986? Which that's that's a, a oddly morbid combination. It's such a fun combo. Unfortunately, it was available. I think at the beginning of this month when I was looking for things, it's gone now. Can't find it anywhere. The only way I could find to watch it is to buy a thirty dollar DVD and wait for it to arrive. And <laughs> no part of that appeals to me. No, we did watch the evil twin because we (laughs) tend to watch the evil twins first yeah and that was not a horror movie it was a thriller based on a mary higgins clark book yeah it was a little bit of a lifetime original of sorts yeah so i feel like okay so those two are out forget those pretend we never said anything instead tomorrow's adventure we're going to skip right over that we got something new that we're adding at the end of the month you're going to find out about it's an amazing special <laughs> treat yes just for us not it's for you honestly my most favorite pairing of the whole month <laughs> but tomorrow we're going to be seeing high tension from 2003 and we're going to pair that with high anxiety from 1977 Ooh, that is a good 2021 pair. Yes. A little high tension, a little high anxiety. And now high anxiety, that ain't no horror movie, but I, it was by far the most appropriate choice to match with high tension. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to them. I will see you tomorrow when we talk about them. Indeed. Cannot wait. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Today, so today, so, so, so. Interesting. Today, interesting. Um, so interesting.
today? Um, interesting. Today, so... 